Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in today. So today I have the pleasure of bringing to you a 2018 Lexus LC500. Um, you may also be wondering why I look funny. So I'm, it's Halloween and I'm dressed up like Clark Kent. So I had to dress up for the kids later passing out trick or treating. So I figured I'd dress up for y'all too. It may look a little funny cause it's probably mid November when you're seeing this, but hey, we're going with it. So, 2018 Lexus LC500 in the signature infrared red color. Um, so I've actually had the pleasure of spending a little bit of time with this car, more than just you know picking it up yesterday and reviewing it. And I have to say, I absolutely love this car. So preface, <laughs> I did I go through and make a whole long list of pros and cons about the car, things I like, things I don't like, but I mean, look at it. Even so, this car actually debuted middle of last year, middle of 2017, um, and this one was actually purchased by a friend of mine in May 2017. So it's been out for a while, you know, it's been around, but it still has so much what we call visual wattage. It just gets all the looks and all the stares everywhere you go. Um, so a little bit. So let's go over the outside of it a little bit. It's so this car falls into the class of. A, what we call a grand touring coupe you know a large generally a two plus two car big engine rear wheel drive um the but a a vehicle to take two people and their luggage cross country at high rates of speed if you live in europe or very slowly if you're here in america with us so we've got your classic long hood short deck profile um two doors. Of course, the trend now is having huge wheels on everything. So this car does have some rather exaggerated 21 inch wheels on it. Let's move around front. All right. So one of the first things that you notice about this car around the front of it is all of this going on right here. So this car has what we call Lexus's signature spindle grill. Um, and it's this, this sort of hourglass shaped design motif that they have put on all of their cars over the past five, seven years or so. Um, it also has the nickname of the Predator Grill. <laughs> you can Google that for some really fun images if you want. But this is one of the first cars where it has really, really worked. The whole car was designed to fit this grill. Um, when they first came out with it, they just sort of tacked it on to some of their existing cars, which I think was a lot of the reasoning behind calling it the Predator Grill. Um, but here, I think it works. It doesn't look completely like it wants to eat you in the land of, in the time period of cars that have giant unnecessary grills. Um, so yeah, we have spindle grill. We have the huge Lexus L symbol on the grill. And that serves two purposes, one form and one function, believe it or not. So of course the form to let everyone know that you can afford a Lexus. But the second one is that this is actually where all of the sensors and things for the adaptive cruise control and the automated emergency braking are housed. So that's why on most modern luxury cars, you see they have these giant pie plate sized emblems on the front grill. Um, it's better, you see some automakers don't, don't integrate it quite like that and it doesn't come off quite as successfully. So I actually like that. Um, and that's actually very reasonably sized for these. Check out the Mercedes GLS if you want to see a truly huge um, grill emblem. Additionally, we've got the uh, so the signature LED lights on the car. It's supposed to be shaped kind of like an L. Um, it only works. It only really works on one side, but you know, just transpose it, mirror your phone. Standard, standard full LED headlights with automatic high beams and cornering. Um, but yeah, so the front of the car. Of course, you can't really see it, but this huge four foot long hood that houses houses the engine. So let's go take a look at the side. All right, so back up here at the front, and one thing, probably one of the most visually interesting things about this car, because I don't think it may have been done before, but in recent history, a major, a mainline automobile, I don't remember ever seeing a one where the hood comes up here, drops down, and then the rest of the body line continues along the car. That is unique. Um, 
in the automotive world, definitely among cars that are for sale right now, you could probably go back to the 30s or 40s when they were trying a lot of things um, and find find something that did that. But you know, for modern modern conservative designs, this isn't seen, and it it's really interesting. It really gives the car an a interesting look. Um, it allows him to get away with the. Let me get out of the way. <laughs> The European ma mandated high hood line for pedestrian impact um, protections, but also have a nice low windowsill that you, you can actually see out of this car, which is quite refreshing. Now, granted, it's not a, a panorama greenhouse, but it's not a, a little pillbox view out all the way around either, um, which is really, really great. Let me, okay, now let's move. I... <laughs> And let's move around here to the back. All right, so let's do a three, three or three quarter angle here. There are three things that I don't work that that I don't think work on this car. First, it does not photograph well at all. Um, I was a little anxious, like you know, when it came out as a concept car, looking exactly like this. Um, it's like, is it going to look good? And you know, what, wasn't quite sure about it. it just it looked a little off. Um, and then finally seeing when a person is like, oh, okay, like that's how it's not like you, you're just, your eye just gets it better. Um, like I look at even at the camera right now, like it looks sort of tall and awkward and this car is super short. Like it, this is hard for me to do to get the car and my face in the camera at the same time because I'm so much taller than it is. Um, but yeah, pictures absolutely do not do, do it justice. Even seeing it now going back and looking at pictures of it again like in an article or something i'm like does it like it's been a couple of weeks since i've seen the car maybe it doesn't but then i see it in person again it's like okay it actually is a phenomenal looking car with two small exceptions to that to me anyways um i have terrible taste so you shouldn't listen to anything i say but this area right here um where there's a lot of things that just sort of come together like we've got this this chrome strip that runs runs along the roof and then the the red part of the roof and then they just sort of stop um and then there's this like black space here that doesn't join up with the I, I don't know to me it looks a little bit disjointed if you concentrate right here on this one square foot of the car um and then third there's this weird so yeah i know the for the exhaust tips, um, this isn't the actual exhaust. The the little circles, the little actual um, exhaust pipes are in there, but they're just sort of dump out into this thing. This isn't actually the end of the exhaust pipe. Um, but this definitely, this is actually like, it, it sort of looks like they were going for a split quad exhaust setup. I, I don't know, I can't really tell why this little piece is here. It's just sort of awkward. Um, it seems like it should just be this one big opening where the exhaust actually dumps out, but oh well. Other than that, um, I think the car looks phenomenal. One last thing. Oh, sorry. Two last things. All right, so looking at the brake lights, um, we have them, they're supposed to sort of, they're supposed to sort of look like an F, um, and that's for Lexus's F Sport division. It's their high performance line, like a Mercedes AMG or BMW M, uh, Lexus's is F. So it's sort of styled it, you know, it's the, the F here. Um, the turn signals are, are very interesting, that they just sort of like come down to the side here. Um, these lights, I'm actually going to, I'm going to apologize in advance for my shaky hand, <laughs> but these taillights are interesting because they actually, they actually come off of the car. Um, and let's see, you can actually see they're sort of like textured. They're plastic. They're not real metal. Um, but they've just got a really neat look to them and you can sort of see the F a lot better there. Um. But yeah, so I think the, the taillights are cool. Just a lot of cool little touches that they didn't have to do on the car, but they decided, you know, it's this is our this is our flagship, this is our showpiece. Let's do it. 
All right, so now let's take a look at the inside of the car, which is, in my opinion, equally as stunning as the outside. All right, so you'll note that these are the door handles. Um, they're flush mounted, just like, like a Tesla. Um, it's become kind of popular. Land Rover and Jaguar use it now as well. But I think that this setup is a lot better. Um, this, so like this is a Toyota company and reliability, longevity, dependability are very important things, uh, very important cultural concepts to them. It's not just something they talk about. It, it's something they actually do. <laughs> um, it's why I use Lexus will hold its value. It's why you see 30 year old Lexus is driving around, you know, in disrepair. You, they've obviously been neglected, but they still run. Um, and that whole, all of that, you can see all of that just with this one simple thing. Um, so a Tesla door handle actually powers out of the car and lets you grab it and pull it open. That doesn't always work. It's failure prone. Um, and then if it doesn't, you're, you can't use your car. You're either stuck with this uh, pocket knife trying to pry the thing out, or you've got to call the tow truck and go. Lexus has a simple solution. It's probably been used before. Um, I've just never seen it, but they decided to instead, you just push in on this side, this thing pops out and you pull the door open. Um, simple as that. When you want to lock the car, you leave, you just push this back in and it locks the car. If you don't have the key inside the car, you need to have that on your person for it to work. Um, but yeah, it just goes back in and it's flush mounted again. So I think, you know, just, just this little pivot here, just a, a little thing like that. I mean, yeah, you can't say, Hey guys, watch this and then click it and watch the door handles raise out, but you're also not stuck you know, in the middle of the, in that five o'clock in the morning in January, trying to leave for work when it's 20 degrees and the door handles won't extend on the car because they're frozen. Um, so yeah, just a little thing like that. I appreciate stuff like that, knowing that, you know, 30 years from now, this is probably still going to be functioning. You know, it won't be on its fifth replacement unit. All right. So before we jump to the interior, I did want to go over the window sticker for this car. Um, so this car is not a base model. It does have a few options on it. Base price for one of these is, as you can see, 92000 And this one's got about $11,000 in options on it, which is extremely common um, for cars like this. You know, you would think that they just come with everything, but there's actually a lot <laughs> left to do. So this is uh, colors infrared. The, interestingly, this is actually made in the same factory that produced the Lexus LFA, um, which is like this previous high-end sport, uh, super specialty car. It actually has some styling similar to this. You know, it's, a, it's the same basic shape, a big front engine um, two-door car, but it costs about $350,000. Um, was very limited edition. This is much more of a mass market vehicle. So just, but yeah, I just wanted to show you all the window stickers. You can see what we're working with. Um, it's got a couple of options on it. Um, most notably the 21 inch wheels are an option. Um, heads up display, limited slip differential, which is great for performance, upgraded sound system, um, premium paint, which seems like a lot. So, um, the premium, so the infrared is a $595 option. Um, just to put that in perspective, in case you're not familiar, if you buy a $40,000 Mercedes C-Class and want it painted beige, that's a $720 option. So $595 is actually a phenomenal price for what is a really, really great paint job. Um, and most importantly, the sport package with the carbon fiber roof um, and upgraded seats and a few other things, which I forgot to show you the carbon fiber roof. Sorry, let's go look at it now. <laughs> um, but yeah, so this is a, so it's carbon fiber on this car. Um, if you don't get carbon fiber, it's just a, a fixed glass roof. I don't think there's any option for an opening roof in this car. And you can just see the, oh, let's see if we can pull it in. And we're not going to because my phone is five years old. Um, but yeah, you can just see the, the woven technology on that. It's done to reduce weight. Um, up high in the car, which is kind of comical. We'll talk about weight a little later. Um, we'll just save that. But yeah, so ostensibly to lightweight the car, lower the center of gravity um, for improved handling and cornering ability. All right, so front seat passenger, front, front seat comfort for two passengers is phenomenal. Um, absolutely first rate. 
extremely comfortable seats, good bolstering. Um, if I mention this, it is a two plus two. So the plus two means in emergencies, you could take two more people with you in the back seat. Um, this car is kind of pushing that a little bit. It is really, really tight in the back seat. And I'm, I've got the seat adjusted comfortably for myself um, in the front. Plenty of room, plenty of room, great bolstering, um, as I mentioned. And I've driven this car for a couple, I've been in the seat for a couple of hours, no problem. Um, Eight-way adjustable seats, heated and ventilated. But in order for, I've adjusted the passenger seat for, um, sat for having me again in the back seat. So if I needed to get into the back of this car, I would need to sit. <laughs> right about here <laughs> so and I'm actually going to show you what I can actually get into the back the handy oh and this is we never put the we never actually put these on um, so this well as you can tell because I don't know how to use it where does it Oh, okay, it comes out there. I knew one of these came out. So this is to sort of, you know, hold your seatbelt on the seat so you can grab it easily when you're driving. And then if someone's got to get in the back, you just sort of ostensibly, when you do this, it pulls off. The passenger side works <laughs> well. It worked the other day. All right, so getting in the back here, there's a little handy dandy handle on the back seat and you can actually see, um, if I can get out of the way, when you pull that, pull it forward, it actually motors the seat forward a little bit um yeah this is gonna be really pretty <gasps> here <laughs> not comfortable not really there's actually decent shoulder space back here just Nowhere for my feet to go, or my knees, but... So you can fit four, six foot plus people in this car if you really want to. No one's gonna be comfortable at all, but it can be done. I've done it before, I'll probably do it again. All right, now coming inside the car, and unfortunately, so this one is black. Um, all black everything <laughs> except for the little there are some nice um like aluminum finished looking accents strewn about but the car does come in i think what lexus is considering the signature color is this tan um but ever like the steering wheels tan the dash top it like everything is tan um but the, which i i don't like I, I i cannot one thing i cannot do is a tan steering wheel I just can't. They get so dirty so fast and I just, I, I can't look at it. Um, but there's also a really nice red that isn't red. It's, you know, black steering wheel, black carpets and things, just like red seats and, and things in here. Um, and a specialty white and blue and orange and several other colors that I haven't actually seen in person. Um, but yeah, so we're here with black. The only bad thing about the black is it sort of hides, um, a lot of what makes the interior cool so there's there's this this alcantara here which if you've been watching you know is not my favorite material but like it's here where you're, you're not touching it all the time you know it's just you're here for looks and sound dampening um, this door handle is nice it's actually a real metal door pull um, it feels like it's like a solid piece which is which is very fancy um, other things that are metal these the um, Shift paddles, paddle shifters behind the steering wheel um, feel like they're metal. A lot of this metal looks, metal stuff is actually plastic that just looks like metal, but that is so common. I mean, you can find that Bentleys and probably even Rolls Royce even still does that. Um, so, sorry about the shaking. If you know anything about a Lexus of recent vintage, you have probably heard about this. So this little trackpad is how you control the navigation system. In theory, it works like a mouse um, that you sort of move around 
just you know you're you're using your you're using your finger on the trackpad to move the mouse around the screen in practice it requires a lot of eye time off of the road it's i just think there are better alternatives so my friend whose car this is he has a, a different lexus that he drives a lot more this one only has 4300 miles of it 4300 miles on it even after a year which is of course not on the screen that i'm showing you anyways um but he is a fan he likes it um oh got a text message so i'm willing to give it a shot after you drive it a little while it gets a little more intuitive um, there are shortcuts over here. So that was the main menu screen. Um, there are you, there's hard keys to go, to go along with this. I do think they did a, a decent job. Hard keys for almost all of your climate control as well as your stereo. So you don't have to go into here a ton. Um, and the voice recognition is also pretty good. I've, I've used that several times, but just the trackpad itself, not a huge fan. Um, Additionally, let's see if we can go, let's go back to this main menu. Pairing your phone. So you would think that would be simple. Um, you would think you would do it under phone. <laughs> oh, when mine's are, oh, let me turn my Bluetooth off so that it will disconnect and pretend that there's no phone. So let's say we're, we've just gotten to the car and we need to add a phone. Go back. So you would think that, you know, you would go here to your menu screen, go under phone, and it's telling you there's no Bluetooth device connected. And it's like, okay, well, I'd like to add, like, I don't have either of these. So how do I get a new device? There's, there's nowhere. I'll just go ahead and, and spo spoil the suspense. It's not here. <laughs> I actually had to find it. I had probably had driven this car five times and looked before I was able to find that you have to go menu. Let's see if I can even remember this. Um, set up, phone, there's no Bluetooth device connected, please. Oh, no, that's not it. Gosh, it's not even here. I honestly don't remember how I was able to find the phone, um, which is something that should be very simple. I mean, you should go to the phone screen and be able to add a phone. So that's just kind of an oversight. Um, one other while while we're going under over qualms um let's see let me pull out so i actually remembered to bring and look at my huge long list of notes here which i invariably spend hours and hours putting together and then forget when i'm actually shooting the video <laughs> so i well, i won't be able to show you so it's more of a driving mode thing i won't be able to show you while i'm driving so I will show you the shifter. Um, this is pretty much the shifter out of a Prius. It doesn't, it just sort of like you move it around. It, it doesn't actually go anywhere. It's just a little electronic duflachi. And it just doesn't give you that good tactile feel that you want. Um, it honestly isn't, if, if it weren't for this little bit right here that just immediately brings to mind a Prius shifter, if you've ever seen one before, it's not all that different than what BMW and a lot of people are using. I'm old fashioned and an automatic. I still prefer to like pull it back into drive, have it stay there, you know, push it forward into reverse, push it up into park and leave it. And I have like a little, this one has a little park button, which you can't see it's washed out. Um, but I, I just, I dislike this. And also when you're in reverse, the whole time you're in reverse, it dings. Why does it have to ding? I don't understand. I know it's in reverse. I put the car in reverse. The backup camera is on the screen because it's in reverse. Like I don't need this incessant dinging. And it's really great if like you go to back up and then you're waiting for someone to walk by in a parking lot. So you're just sitting there. Yeah. Um, and the backup camera itself is the resolution is okay. But when you, I mean, you can see, as I turn the wheel, the lines don't move. Generally, they, they move to sort of show you where you're, you can be going. Ostensibly, I mean, these two are for, for directly back, and then this is your max. You know, if you turn the wheel all the way, you'll go off in this direction, but it just seems a little bit basic for a, a six-figure car. 
Um, all right, so that's enough dinging. You probably get the point. Um, but yeah, this screen, so the screen's a pretty good size. It's an over 10 inch screen, but you can't split it. Um, you just sort of, you get all this here. You can pull up these little things on the side, which is similar. So for your, you know, your, your, your shortcuts for climate control, you can do all of this with these buttons. Um, as you can see, you can't set it to dual, you can't sync the dual zones and you can't change mode man. Um, so you can't change where it's coming out unless you come into here. But it's nice that you can do all of this. You get your front, uh, sensibly there would be a back seating in the larger models. Um, and then your, your heated seat and steering wheel buttons. Which also while I'm here, one of the big, big wins for Lexus in my opinion is this auto feature for the seats. It automatically, it takes what you've set the temperature at and then what the outside temperature is. And if it, if, you know, if it's blowing heat out, it just goes ahead and turns the heated seats on. Um, for someone like me, that's a godsend because I always remember about 10 minutes into a drive, oh yeah, I've got heated seats. It used to be okay because you could just, you know, when it got de to December, you could just like flip a switch and they stayed on. Now everything is done electronically and it resets to off every drive. So you have to remember every single drive, you've got to turn your heated seats on. Um, so I'm a big fan of this because the car actually remembers for you, you know, it, the steering wheel as well. If it's cold, it turns the, steer the heated steering wheel on. Um, and of course, if you don't want it on, you can come here and change it. But I mean, who doesn't want their heated steering wheel on? <laughs> so yeah, big win for Lexus. I do like, um, there's a little bit of wasted space right here. And in some of their other models, they actually have hard buttons for the heated seats right here. I'm a fan of buttons, um, especially for something like that. It's really easy to use. I don't want to have to go into the screen to do it. I just want, just give me a quick little button push right here and I can do it. But at the very least, because of the auto setting, you don't have to come in here. It's not like you have to come in every time, pull up the screen, hit the buttons, wait for it to do it. It just, it does it itself. Um, so that it, it's a little thing, but it's actually a huge win in using the car on a day to day basis. So, but yeah, sorry, we were doing shortcuts, um, trip computer, and there's actually a, so you can, you've got this little trip computer here. Um, you can go back in time a little bit, 19 miles to the gallon, not bad in a, a car with a five liter V8 with almost 500 horsepower. And then just a little bit of range. Um, you can also get that on a bigger screen here, a full screen thing. Um, while we're here, it does have, of course, it has traffic. Um, you can see the weather, see what it's, you know, you've got all these options for weather, um, which is nice. You get a little three day forecast coming ahead. Hmm, where were we? And then of course your music. Um, music, oh, okay, sorry, my bad. Let's do big music. Um, so stereo system is phenomenal. As we saw on the spec sheet, this has the upgraded Mark Levinson sound system, um, which really does have phenomenal sound. The only hard part is, of course, there, 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 is, a, um, there is a tune scroll wheel here, which is another piece that actually feels metal. It's actually tactile like it looks. Um, and then a seek, seek, and then this, actually, this is volume. I'll ne it'll never actually read up on there. But so this is your volume. Um, but I like, so several other other car companies, oh, that's the right, I'm hearing voices. Um, let's turn you off. We'll give you a list of the presets, uh, not the, excuse me, not the presets, um, the uh, station list. So this one is really slow. So anytime you need to update, like if you're driving along the highway and want it to update the station list, it has to do this every time. I'm really not sure why, because BMW just sort of does it. Like it just happens on an ongoing basis. It just gives you a new list. And additionally, so I'm, the, it, it turns off your radio station while it's refreshing. So you don't, can't even listen to the one that you were listening to while it's refreshing the list. I don't know why that's a huge miss to me. Um, and it makes it really frustrating to know if there's a song coming on, if I'm driving, you know, I'm half an hour down the road, stations are changing. I've, I can either, you know, do the tune, but if I want to actually 
update the list that I'm scrolling through. I've got to wait for it to do all of this. So maybe that's just me. Most people, <laughs> most sane people in 2018 just hook up their phone to Pandora. I'm a big terrestrial radio fan, so it's annoying to me. All right, so moving along. So one of the really cool things, um, okay, I'm gonna try and do this so that it doesn't wobble so much about this car is this, the instrument cluster. So of course it's adjustable. There is actually, there's two little Frankenstein knobs that stick out of either, on either side of the binnacle, um, I guess fitting for Halloween. And so this one actually controls your drive mode. Um, you just, you twist it. It actually took me a minute. So you, you twist it up. Um, so quick apology. I just realized I've been shooting. Oh, I'm doing it literally right now. <laughs> shooting the whole thing with the phone up and down mode. I don't know why, but that's, I guess, cause, cause I, how I use it on a daily basis, that's what's most natural to me. Um, so I may have to go back and redo some of that or I may just go with it. We'll see. Anyways, on to the instrument, been instrument cluster. So you can see here, it is actually, it's fully digital. It's a, um, an led screen that just, it, it shows what it needs to show. Um, but it is adjustable. So this, it, and it changes with the drive mode selector over here. Um, so yeah, it's actually, if we back up a little bit, the binnacle sort of has these two little Frankenstein knobs sticking out of it, which I guess is, is, um, timely for Halloween. But so this one, there's different modes and they change how the, how it looks. Um, so you've got, I think the only three are, yeah, comfort and eco. Eco's a little different, but not noticeably so, but then sport and then sport S plus change it a lot, which seems kind of redundant. Like it's sport S plus or sport S. Um, why not just sport? You know, comfort isn't comfort C or eco E but for some reason. Sport is sport S plus. Um, Anyway, so that's nice and configurable. There is one little party trick. So there are buttons on the steering wheel to control, to control the menu that's in here. So if we push the button to the left, um, let's see if it'll focus, refocus. If we push the button, oh, I just lied. There's some, oh, there we go. So we push that button. The, it actually, you can't really tell because it all kind of looks like an LCD screen. Um, but the, this, piece in here actually motors over uh, and now shows us, gives us an option over here for a screen where we can do some quick adjustments of things, uh, radar, cruise control, music, see our music, compass, uh, what gear we're in, and then change a few settings in the car if we want to. And then once you're done, you just hit the back button again and it's back over to standard mode. So that's kind of neat. Um, there's a lot in here. It is unusual to see such a large uh, graph over here for oil temperature. So it, they may look the same, but this is, so we got oil temperature, um, water coolant temperature, which is your temperature gauge that you're probably used to seeing in your car. And then of course, um, your fuel. You can also zoom me back out to the steering wheel a little bit. Um, a lot going on. So this is the, the, this, the, these control the, um, what goes on in here. Of course you got your volume, your telephone, you push this for voice commands. Over here, uh, what I really appreciate is the stuff for the cruise control and the automatic cruise control. This is um, audio mode and seek. But I like this, this button I like in particular. Let me set my elbow down. This is a button for the lane keeping assist and you can just turn it on and off right here. Um, and they'll show up in the screen there. Lane, I don't, I don't love the lane keeping assist in this car, but sometimes it's useful. And I like the, rather than having to go through the whole screen, do all that or, or do something in here, there's just a button dedicated for it right here. Um, you don't even have to think about it. And same for the, the auto, the cruise, you can set your cruise control, um, distance and things. If you have your cruise control set, you can change the distance here. Um, all that's right here. But yeah, I, I really appreciate this button a lot in the car. Um, I don't love this. It looks a little better in person. This looks really plasticky to me. Um, luckily it's, it's a little bit better proportioned here. Some of the Lexuses have it. I mean, it's like the whole steering wheel. It's like a giant piece of plastic sitting here, staring you right in the face in your luxury car. 
which I just think that they could have done that a little better. It, it has a nice finish on it, but you can still kind of tell. This one's a little bit better, but especially the bigger ones, you can just tell they're plastic. So I just would have liked to see them spend a couple more cents in making that better. Again, here it's okay, it's passable, and like an ES350, RX350, no, no good. Um, but yeah, so I think that's, that's mostly the interior. One thing you will notice, um, there's kind of a dearth of cup holders. There's one, just one. Um, there is, if you, so sliding back around to the, the center armrest where most of your storage is in this car. Um, so if you push that back, this sort of acts kind of like a cup holder uh, if you really want it to. I, I don't know if it's designed to or not, but you can kind of, you can set a drink here. It's not really going to hold it into place all that well. Um, but you can set the drink in here. In addition to a dearth of cup holders, there's a dearth of power outlets. This is to what, to my, what I could find the one and only cigarette lighter outlet. And then we've got two USB plugs, excuse me, which may be okay. But if like, if you've got a radar detector, a, you've got to you've got to do that annoying thing where you have it on the windshield and then you've got a cord running all the way back here. Um, but it just seems like there could be, I mean, maybe another one in here somewhere, just something like that. Um, but this is nice. This is actually, it has a teeny little light on the back. So at night you can actually see what's in here, um, felt lined. There are map pockets, uh, in both of the doors, but that's really the extent of your storage. There's no really great place in here to just, you know, set your phone or anything once you get in the car. Um, this is not really flat enough or grippy enough to put anything on. Same, I mean, you could on the dashboard, but then it's, it, the dashboard is very close to being in your line of sight in this car because of that, the shape of that hood, how that hood comes up. Um, so yeah, just not a lot of, not a lot of little knickknack storage here for your, your thing, your keys, your phone, your sunglasses. Um, there's no sunglass, sunglass holder up here. Um, so here's a view, quick view at the back seats. As you can see with mindset for me, there is maybe an inch of space between my seat back and the back seat. Um, they are. All right. Oh, actually, if I'm going to be Clark Kent, I should probably be Clark Kent. Um, so trunk of the car. <laughs> so I mentioned two plus two grain touring, two people and two people and their luggage for like a week, two week vacation. Ostensibly, it really started, so the whole GT thing, Grand Touring thing, is like a European thing. British people going, driving down to the coast of France, you know, to the Mediterranean for a holiday. You know, French people driving out to the Alps to go skiing, things like that. You know, your well-to-do people, the jet set crowd, um, crisscrossing Europe in their big fancy cars. So this was gonna have a little trouble with that. So it looks like we, you know, we can tell we've got a full trunk here. This is one carry-on size suitcase and one milk crate. That's it. That's all you can fit. So it's five cubic feet. Um, and you really, if, <laughs> if, you've, if you've seen another trunk at any point in your life, and then you open the trunk to this one, you just can't help but be struck by how shallow it is. I mean, you can see, like, this is just a normal size suitcase. It isn't anything big, and it's the tallest thing that you can put in here. <laughs> um, I had to the other day, I had to get them, uh, put the milk crate in here. Now, so some awkward stuff in here. Um, and I was like, oh, maybe I can just, I can just set it here. It looks like it'll clear. It's gonna, nope. It doesn't clear. <laughs> you have to push it all the way to the back, which relegates you to. Gosh, it, no, it even go there. No, it won't. So you could take two milk crates in this car. But I will say it's not as bad as something like an Audi R8. An Audi R8 actually has a smaller trunk, and here this this very suitcase um, in an R8 just does fit in the trunk. And it's probably 80% of the space. You couldn't take two of them for sure. It's probably this one little suitcase is about 80% of the space in an R8. Um, but this car, I say it doesn't have a trunk. Your trunk is the back seat. 
not my favorite way to travel with a bunch of stuff piled up right behind me, but it is an option if you have it. There is, there's not a pass through to the back seat. The back seat doesn't fold down or anything, um, but you do have that option. There's, you can put a little bit of stuff here. I'm going to guess, I forgot to read up on it. I'm going to guess Lexus probably says you can fit golf clubs in here. Uh, I don't know, maybe. I'll have to go online and look that up, but not a very big trunk. It's shallow. Looking at the car, it, you can tell why. I mean, it, if you look at it from the side, there's just nowhere for it to go. I mean, the wheel, the back seat's right there. There's huge wheels, the sophisticated suspension, fuel tank's got to go somewhere. There's just no room to put a trunk. Unless they, you know, extended the body work, redid the styling, all that stuff, which, you know, would be fine on a Corolla. But a car like this that's all about how it looks, not a worthwhile sacrifice. And not one that I would have wanted them to make. If, you know, looking like this necessitates a small trunk, we got a small trunk. Um, but yeah, so don't plan on taking a lot of stuff with you in this car, unless you're okay piling it to the ceiling in the back seat. Alright, so under the hood we've got... One of the things that makes this car most special, this is this car has Lexus's five liter, um, 471 horsepower, 398 pound feet of torque, V8. Um, naturally aspirated, no turbos, no supercharger, nothing like that. Backing that up is their brand new 10 speed automatic transmission, fully developed in house. Um, and this engine absolutely sings. It's at a 7300 RPM redline, which is really pretty high for an engine that size. Um, and especially one that you can slow down and be docile and quiet and gentle, like a Lexus has to be, but that it can also scream up to that redline um, with not too far off of 100 horsepower per liter. Quite an accomplishment. Um, of course, there's not a whole lot that you can see. It'll let you see a little bit. If this was my car, this, oh, I keep, I keep stepping on my cord and pulling it off, um, it's buzzing at me. If this were my car, this is lovely, um, this plastic carbon fiber look thing. I want to see the engine. Just a quick, I mean, it's not much, you can't see a whole lot. It's not like it's an Alfa Romeo V6 with beautifully polished intake runners, but I mean, just that, and it lets a, just a little bit more of that wonderful sound in. Um, and you've still got your little carbon fiber piece here, dual, um, dual intake air runners that actually help to make it, make that lofty horsepower figure. Um, but yeah, not much to see here. We'll talk about it a little bit more on the road. Actually, before we move around to the trunk, one thing that I cannot, I've Googled, I've researched, I can't quite find it out. Um, first, okay, so I put the engine cover back on so you can stop freaking out, Greg. <laughs> At these, what is, what is this? I'm going to bring you in real close so you can see. It's this weird little post with exclamation point. It's, a, you know, it, it's got a few warnings on it. You know, it tells you where it's made, but it doesn't tell you what it is. Um... But yeah, there's there's one here and there's one over there. I can't figure out what they are. This one is in here pretty solidly. This one sort of wobbles around a little bit. I if any if you know what that is, put it in the comments. I guess I'm I'm guessing maybe it's something to do with the headlights, but I can't tell. If you know, let me know. Now, before we hit the road, I'm gonna let you in on one of the single best things about this car. It's not how it looks, it's not how it drives, it's not how much space it has in the trunk. <laughs> Hold please. <laughs> so it's increasingly rare for a... Oh, cool. Awesome. Trying, it keeps reverting away from me, but I'm trying this this dual camera thing, um, so you can not only see me when I'm not glaring in the sun, um, but see the road in front of us as well. And I guess because you can't see what we just did, I'll have to circle around and do it again. Let's see where can I turn around? I want to see. So does anyone else have this weird thing? Um, 
I love circle driveways. I think they're the greatest thing ever. And it, like, anytime I see one, I just want to like drive around it. <laughs> now that I ever would, I mean, I'm an adult. I know that you can't just drive around someone's driveway, but I always really wanted to like drive around these circle driveways. Let's see. There's the dinging. Gotta love it. And I hope the mic is picking up enough of this exhaust note. Because it really does, as much as the mediocre steering takes away from the car, the exhaust just adds it all right back in. Like, maybe even at the top. And it sort of pops when it upshifts and it just, it really just makes the experience so much better. I mean, th in this day and age when new performance cars are always turbocharged, they some manufacturers jump through hoops to make them sound halfway decent. Just have an engine that sounds decent to start with. Like, as you can see, plenty of grip, plenty of brakes for having fun on a regular public road. Um, you know, this car does fall a little bit on its face in actual track driving. It's just not as good as like a Porsche 911 would be, like a mid, a mid to upper trim 911. But on the flip side of that, it doesn't cost $140,000. So we looked earlier at the sticker. This car starts at 92. This one, pretty well fully equipped. One or two things that you could get extra there's an active a rear wheel steering um, option and a little like active rear spoiler thing um, the rear steering would be nice and it changed it actually does change this steering um, the overall steering setup and from what I've read gives it a little bit more feel uh, but still doesn't make it great so that's one thing you could do to, to sort of liven this up a little bit be yeah, a full, I mean, full all, all of the creature comforts and the main, like the sport package and things that you want for 103000 I went onto the Porsche configurator and priced out what a similarly equipped 911 would be. Um, a 911S, which gives up 50 horsepower to this car, but actually is ever so slightly quicker. Um, similar equipment, nice paint, good wheels, upgraded seats, you know, all the, the full LED headlights, adaptive cruise control, the works. It's almost $140,000. And I know to, to people with a, a regular budget, you know, you're like, oh, well, if you can afford a $100,000 car, you can afford a $140,000 car. But there's a lot of space between a hundred and $140,000. Even if you were adamant that, oh, well, this is more comparable to a, a base 911, that's still gonna be like 125 or maybe even more for a car that to me doesn't have as nice of an interior doesn't look as nice it maybe looks as expensive like your mind knows like oh that's a Porsche that's an expensive car I don't think it's got the exterior styling um, and it's just you're paying so much money for that last little bit of track capability now granted in Porsche's defense their car is equally as comfortable on the road you know it's not like you're you're trading on-road comfort for track performance it keeps its on-road comfort and adds a little bit at the track but how often are you really going to use that for my money i think this is a car to have and it does edge the porsches out in engine note and sound they're one of the ones they they've gone turbocharged they've had to add go back and try and add things into the car to make it a little bit more engaging um, they actually inject fuel into the exhaust to give it little snap crackles and pops things to try and mask the fact that the exhaust note just isn't quite as good as their old naturally aspirated engines. Um, just get a car with a good naturally aspirated engine like this one. So talking, since we're talking about competitors, something that I see being a natural direct competitor to this car is BMW's new 8 series. So it'll be interesting to see how the two uh, compare 
looks wise, I think it's a pretty even game. I mean, the 8 Series has going for it that it's brand new and fresh, but I still don't think it, it I still don't, without seeing one in person, I don't give it the edge over this car. And of course, it's more expensive. And it's a BMW. So, speaking from experience, it will more than likely have to go to the shop several times. This car, a year and a half in, hasn't been back at the shop except for regular maintenance and car washes. One of the good things about a Lexus dealer is they tend to be really good dealerships. Our local one, I'm still here. Our local one um, gives out, that didn't help at all, free car, you know, free car washes as long as you own the car. Um, a lot of times they include complimentary maintenance. Oh, fire truck. They actually have like, I took the car in for a wash and used, they actually have a little business, they call it a business center, which sounds sketchy to me, but like, a, you know, an own little room where you can go if you need to call someone or do something, um, you know, loud so you don't disturb other people. Just a little shout out to Lexus dealers. Um, so that is one benefit of getting a Lexus because it is looked at, at, Lexus is looked at a little bit as just sort, sort of just below like BMW, Mercedes, all of those, um, what you sort of consider like your top tier luxury brands. But I think from an actual day-to-day -day driving perspective, you know, living with the car, they offer a lot, you know, like the car washes, the reliability. You don't have to, to worry about, oh, well, such and such is broken. You know, the car may not be broken down, but you still got to figure out schedule time to take it to the dealer, drop it off, even with a free loaner car, it's a hassle. So it's nice to just not have to worry about those things. Your car just works like it's supposed to, like you intended it to when you bought it, and you go about your life. I'm gonna turn around and head north in hopes that y'all might actually be able to see me. Um, so, while we're on the topic of driving, So I've been driving around the whole time in Sport S Plus mode, redundant though it may be. Um, it's the hardest edge of the six driving modes that are available, but it really isn't very hard edged. Um, the car still rides way too well in this mode. I, I, I don't know, it, that one of the big pluses of this car is it rides great. Um, so this vehicle actually shares a chassis with Lexus's big LS, their full-size you know sedan um, and weirdly enough this this one actually in my mind rides better than the LS it could possibly be a little psychic psyche thing you know you expect you expect this car to ride bad so it riding decent you know is surprising the LS you expect it to be a cloud on wheels so the fact that it's not it's kind of jarring but this car does ride phenomenally well considering it has gigantic 21 inch wheels with rubber band tires um, and a bit of a sporting mission. They did a great job on the ride. I think Sport S Plus definitely could be firmer because that's what you put it when you want to max attack mode. You know, firmer suspension, hardest throttle. Um, there's a, an adaptive. All right. Um, so I was talking about like how, how it's annoying that you can't adjust that which directly impacts your, how you feel about the car, like your interface with the car, but you can adjust like how many seconds the headlights stay on. Um, 
Well, there's, a, there's a bunch of other things, but like you can adjust like little weird random things like that. But these major things that that you see every time you get in the car and and affect how you feel about the car, like affect your use of the car, you can't adjust. Um, so it's just a little bit annoying. Another annoying Toyota is a super conservative corporation, even by car manufacturer standards, which car manufacturers tend to be very conservative. Um, with it, with everything but they won't let you there's a lot that they lock out in the navigation system if you're driving luckily you can get around a lot of it with voice commands just using the voice prompts but um some of it's nice like i already know where i'm going in here to go find it to just go put in an address you know adjust you know adjust some things um adjust some of those vehicle settings it would be nice to just go and do that you've got to pull off and put it in park and and do that Um, as far as, so I don't really do in, do any interstate in these, but one of the good things about the Lexus's new 10 speed automatic is it has a really, really, really tall tent gear. Uh, several of the last several gears are all overdrive gears, but tent puts you at, so if you're on the interstate cruising along at 80 miles an hour, the engine's only turning about 1600 RPM, which is great for wear and tear it's great for fuel economy it's great for noise you know it just sort of quiets down into the background for your interstate cruising um, on the topic of fuel economy so the car is EPA rated at 16 city 26 highway car and driver actually they do some of their own testing which I really like um, they actually up the speed on the interstate and just do straight interstate like no stopping for the city anything like that and it actually jumped the interstate um, figure that they got instead of 26, they got 29 out of the car, straight interstate. And then um, I think it was 17 city. So not an inefficient car. Of course it does take premium. If you're super concerned about fuel economy, there's a hybrid version of this car. I haven't mentioned it yet. It's not pro projected to be a big seller. I cannot fathom why you would want to buy it. You swap out this wonderful, this wonderful purpose-built V8 for a three and a half liter V6 from a Lexus ES um, 350 hybrid. It does have a, it is tuned to, uh, to a higher spec in this car, and it has a, it does have a tra transmission to it that combines a continuously variable transmission and a four-speed automatic to sort of give you the sensation of of going up through the gears. Um, but I just, you, I, I haven't driven one. I haven't actually ever seen one in person. I just know you lose all of the sound and the drama that comes with the drivetrain of this car. Interstate driving, it is almost the same as this car gets. You do get better in town, of course, but if you're buying something like this, worried about fuel economy, just I'd get something else. <laughs> I don't know, either, to me, that. It's kind of a waste, and I think it's done more for overseas markets, where a five-liter V8 has a much higher tax assessment than a three-and-a-half-liter V6. But still, still, I just, I don't, I don't get it. I don't see it. Um, further on the topic of fuel economy, so the car actually has a relatively massive 21.7 gallon gas tank. But even with that, so I'm showing, I'm reading right, I'm, I've just gone under three quarters of a tank. And if I cruise, if I switch over here to uh, my range, it's telling me I can go 212 miles before I'll need gas. Of course, maybe a few too many of those might be to blame. But that just see, it, you know, it's telling me simultaneously telling me that the lifetime fuel economy average is 17 miles to the gallon. I've got a good 16 gallons left, and I can only go 200 miles. It, it just seems even when I filled it up, it was reading like 280. <laughs> um, so yeah, the range seems to be a little bit off, which is which is odd, and that can be really frustrating on the highway if you're drive driving along trying to get somewhere car tells you you're out of gas so you pull over and stop and you put 15 gallons knowing you have a 21 gallon gas tank I'm trying to get see if we can get back to head in a different direction um but yeah driving oh 
automatic cruise control. Um, it works as advertised. It follows the car in front of it. Um, lane keep assist, I'm not a huge fan of. I mentioned earlier, I don't use it a whole lot mm -hmm. because it, ten it tends to um, try and drive you off the road, which is unfortunate. It will, you'll be going along and let it do it. It'll actually do its thing for fit. You can hold your hands off the wheel for 15 seconds and it will drive itself, keep itself within the lane. But it will, it'll get, it'll get way over close to the left side lane and then it'll send you over to the right side lane, right, right side line. It'll freak out because it thinks you're coming up to the right side lane too fast. It'll do a hard overcorrect back to the left and then it'll just overshoot the left line and just keep going off. Um, so I don't, it's best not to just let it do its thing. You still have to watch it. It's nice if, if you're like, you know, trying to, well, okay, well, let's be honest. If you're maybe sending a text that you shouldn't or doing something, changing the radio and you shouldn't, you just hit the button, turn it on real quick. And it will, you can feel if it's, you know, tugging the wheel. It's like, oh, okay, gotta pay attention again. But so it's a nice thing to have, but I just, I find the automatic, the adaptive cruise control way more useful than the lane keeping assist in its current iteration. Um, and with that, I think there's, I mean, there's not a whole lot more to talk about. Oh, this guy's pulling off. So let's do it. And there's no one behind me. So let's do one final, like, zero to 60 run. There's no launch control or anything like that. Just mat the gas. good brakes um, it's got really good traction considering it's only got 275 section rear tires 245s up front which are fairly modest I saw a Lamborghini's new SUV the other day actually has 325 section <laughs> rear tires which are absolutely ginormous total extravagance um, the car has has great grip for for the small contact patch there we go use your words Matthew um, be a great grip brakes are good I haven't really tested them um, I have this thing about driving other people's really expensive cars where I try not to put myself in a situation where I might wreck it um, but anytime I mean the brake like you saw right there like the brakes will haul it down from speed in a hurry um, yeah brakes are good it's loud it makes great noises it'll quiet down if you want like if you put it in eco or normal it the engine never disappears thank god but it'll quiet down a good bit and i just think as a halo car for the lexus brand i just think this is done absolutely phenomenal um i mean it shows you that you know if you always bought a lexus because it was reliable, because it had good resale value, because it was comfortable uh, and quiet. And this car, it's not the first Lexus that has shown, like this, this engine that's so wonderful that I keep raving about, this isn't even the first car to use it. This is the third, fourth Lexus that got the, this, that engine. It debuted back in their tiny little ISF sedan back in, I think, 08. You know, so the engine has been around a while. They just keep refining it and making it better and better and better. So I bet as a halo car, it is an option. Like, you know, you can buy a Lexus and it can be sporty. It's a great drive. Granted, they've got, they've got a little bit of work to do. Maybe a mid-cycle refresh might see us with, might see us with a better steering system. Might see us with a, a up-to-date upgraded navigation system. Not that this one's dated. It's their most current one, but it just doesn't work as well. Um, and we'll probably see my most Frust the most frustrating thing about going to a car show with this car, and we're like, oh my god, that's so cool. Have you heard about the LCF? I'm like, no, there is no, uh, there is no F Sport right now. So their Lexus is working on a twin turbo version of this car. I don't feel that it needs it. It's this car is plenty fast to have fun with, to get into serious trouble with, and the turbos are just going to ruin the sound. They're going to ruin the sound. They're going to ruin the throttle response. They're going to take away some of the drama. So I almost forgot. So the car has paddle shifters, of course, here on the steering wheel. You can pull them while you're driving to activate a sort of pseudo um, manual mode. 
it really just chooses what gear locks you like if you, if it you pull it and it says D6 it's going to choose any gear it wants up to 6 it won't go past it, well actually sometimes it will it really doesn't do much of anything to get full manual control of the car you actually have to um, pull grab take your Prius shifter and put it down into M for manual mode um, and then it will actually it'll hold the gears at redline it'll actually go into the gear that you tell it to go into unless of course it's going to cause engine damage but then getting it back out of that is actually fairly it's like awkward and kind of complicated and half the time I end up putting it in neutral instead of getting it back into drive so yeah manual mode operation definitely is a little bit to, des to be desired it's not entirely cause, I mean it's 10 gears so it's a lot of work putting it in manual mode and the car does a pretty good job most of the time on its own if you've got it in sport s plus and you start driving aggressively it sort of senses that and alters the shift timing um but yeah just one of those things that could be a little bit easier could be a little bit more polished especially in something with a performance bent to it